Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious with Mr. Terry White beside me here. Hi, How are we doing today? Good to see you. You look great. Your handlebar mustache looks perfect in this low humidity <laughs> today yeah. in Florida. And uh, Terry, of course, has been joining us for over a year. He worked a shuttle program for over 30 years. In the end, he was the manager of the shuttle garages, the three orbital processing facilities around the big vehicle assembly building there. And Terry, what are we going to focus on today? Well, one of our previous episodes, we did some talk about STS-2, mm -hmm. you know, returning to flight after the first one and that. So I figured we'd finish up some more with STS-2. And then you asked the other day if I had any Christmas stories. So I really only recall one we worked a lot of Christmas holidays, uh -huh. a lot of holidays, especially in the early days. But uh, I was senior manager on... on well, wait, we want to save that. We okay. want to stay curious with your Christmas story there, okay? okay? Uh, we're going to wait till way before you're a senior manager there when you were <laughs> just a pup with this new spacecraft. And, you know, of course, the STS-1, the, the first launch was historic. But really, I think the second launch of a reusable spacecraft is the important one to make sure everything worked right. And we had five orbiters, and they all had a maiden flight. And then that second flight, man, things had to be stroked a little bit, probably. And you're going to tell us a little bit about that. Terry, we're looking at our green screen here, courtesy of Carlton Bailey. Uh, there's making a small there. Uh, hit picture he took last night. Were you out in the cold waiting for that Falcon Heavy to go off? No, since I, my house is right next to the Space Center, I don't have to wait. I just just, just looked out the window. Yeah, huh? Yep, I just walk out on the porch when it's time. Uh, well, I went out to Coco, Cape Canaveral Beach to look there because they're bringing back the two uh, boosters and it looked great from that angle. Carlton took this, uh, Marty. I'll put it up there big again, far left is the lights were on pad 39B, our Artemis launch site. And then right beside Terry there is the Falcon Heavies all lit up on pad 39A. And then uh, behind Terry there, let's go maybe this way. Oh, what, what am I doing? Oh, you, we don't have it up there. There you go. Uh, right there in the middle, uh, pad 39A. And then, uh, uh, then next you'd have the 41 with Vulcan. Is, is like this, Marty. Let me make it smaller there. Vulcan is right beside the big lights of 39A. And then you got the VAB. And right there is 40. 41 is right there. 39A, 39B. Great shot there, Carlton. You got a little cloud deck there that it uh, made a beautiful scene on his uh, time exposure there. And Marty chose it as our green screen there so we thought it was unique also carlton bailey thank you and he's keeping us appraised that the falcon heavy will not go tonight it's going to go wednesday at about 8 13 p.m but they do have the starlink scheduled for 11 o'clock today and marty winkle want to say hi to you my co-producer today is episode 950 terry we figured out between marty and i and we're, we're still talking to each other. Yeah. <laughs> and talking to you. From different sides of the room, but yes. Yeah, it's different sides of the room. No, he's the big brother I never had. And love him to death. We've really had a great time doing this. At least I have. And we're glad that you all enjoy it. Including Dave Stangy, who's in day... He's got three more days to work. They're having a big countdown for Dave at work, he said. Oh, okay. Uh, as he enters retirement on uh, Friday. So uh, let's get a couple little things out of the way we do have two astronaut birthdays the national space society is a new partner of the american space museum and particularly stay curious and their space year review uh, will be thursday go to their website or go to our facebook page and i have a link for this uh, the uh, larry boyle chicago society for space studies uh, has been doing his space year in review since 1979. So uh, he is going to have a great uh, review of uh, some of the highlights of 2023 on a, uh, um, uh, uh, not a YouTube, but a um, Streamlabs thing. What am I tra Zoom, trying to say Zoom there, on a Zoom conversation there. 
So I've got the website clicked on that for our friends at National Space Society, and we're going to have some of their uh, people in here starting next year and get you some members. They're going to be great partners with us. Werner von Braun founded this, oh, okay. and this is Ad Astra Magazine, for those of you that aren't familiar with it. So uh, I know the UCAC brothers, Tom and Mark, are because their work's been featured in there. So we're going to build a bridge there, and this is going to be a great relationship. Year end in review is Thursday. Go to our Facebook page or National Space Society website to find uh, what uh, Larry Boyle is going to talk about. Um, boy, think of, back, think, think of the things uh, in 2023. Will anything come to your mind immediately? About the different space things this year? Yeah. Uh, Nothing jumps right out. Remember, I'm not building spacecraft anymore. Right. <laughs> well, you know what launch we're driving towards here, the next one on the on the coast, is number 90 this year. That's right. Yes. 90 on the space coast here. Wow. And uh, they could get 91 with the, the Falcon Heavy gets off for the first of the year. James Webb Telescope doing wonderful things. How about the Starship? Two crash and burns, but yes. they improved the second one over the first one. Yeah, I it think went a little bit further before it crashed. And it did, <laughs> it did. But all the engines worked. Yes. Uh, on that first stage, that was pretty marvelous. How about the country of India making a successful landing on the moon? Yeah. With their little uh, spacecraft, uh, and we brought back some rocks from a asteroid named Bennu. The Osiris Rex mission did. Some of you may have seen those rocks uh, in the Smithsonian Institute. They got. A, a display there or in Houston, and I think L.A. is another one where they have them. Well, Terry, we're going to talk about another thing that really happened that was quite dangerous was the abort launch of Gemini 6. Happened today, December 12, 1965. There we have Wally Schirra seated with the General Tom Stafford. Wally, of course, has passed on, died in his 80s, late 80s, I think about a dozen years ago. In the General Stafford, 92 years strong. Yeah, he was here a while back to watch a launch. Yep. You visit, I, mean, have you esc I know you probably escorted the General around. How about? I, I did, yeah, when we were still processing mm -hmm. when he was in the, came into the OPF, yes. Did he ever make any comments to you? You wish he could fly the shuttle or? Well, well oddly enough, I, I was escorting him around and I asked him if he had any questions about the orbiter and all that. He says, I know a little bit about it. And I said, you know, thinking he's an Apollo astronaut, you know, not necessarily shuttle. And he goes, he was one of the astronauts that went to Congress and sold them on the idea of, oh. of approving the shuttle program. So he knew quite a bit about it. That was the Nixon administration in 1972 approved yeah. it there. Well, they had a T-0, an abort of the hypergolic fuels shown here, uh, the, the Titan II rocket with the Gemini on top of it. 100% oxygen in that cabin, okay. And they had ejection seats, uh, fighter jet style ejection seats. And it is said that Wally Schirra turned to rookie, D uh, of course, Wally Schirra was, was uh, Sigma 7, uh, six orbits of the Earth in 1963. And two years later, he's riding the, uh, the this uh, Gemini. And uh, ignition lit. Nothing happened. He said, I didn't feel anything in my butt. And he <laughs> turned to Stafford and said, don't touch anything. The ejection seat ring is what he's concerned about. Yeah. One, they were only 100 story, 10 stories high, 100 feet. The parachutes wouldn't have come open. Two, think of this. They're bathed two hours in that spacecraft in 100% oxygen. So it permeates their clothes. They light those candles on that ejection seat. They're a Roman candle going out of there. Could be. Tom yes. Stafford said would happen yeah. uh, on there. So, But it never moved. Uh, the, the fuel was great. I watched the replay on the YouTube. Pretty cool that Wally was very calm. And there he, he was, we're looking at the pressure of the tanks. They're stable. They're stable. You know, that's the first indication. There was no fire. It took him 20 minutes to pull the gantry back up to get him out of there. Nothing like the shuttle era that you trained astronauts on. Yeah. What do you think all that, looking the, back, 1965? Well, you look back at that, those guys were test pilots. So they were used to things not working correctly mm -hmm. in jet aircraft and that. So 
they know to go think it out. Don't don't panic. Don't do something all of a sudden. Think about what's happening, what's not working right, and figure out why it's not working right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it too is talking out loud, so that if they do die, they are they're reading the gauges and so forth right mm -hmm. down to the line. I know that that is what the Gemini 12 guys were doing. They were laughing when they were struck by lightning. Yes. But Pete Conrad was just started reading off telemetry things, thinking, you know, I'm going to, goodbye. I'm going to just be saying. It's my, it's my uh, job to give them as much history as I can. Yeah. So, yeah. Have you ever heard, known that to be true and seen people doing that? And you're, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, the, uh, the problem was a, a plug fell out at the bottom of the rocket which activated a computer that didn't sense anything was moving and it hit the, the cutoff. So uh, it was a computer age in 1965. Uh, they had almost thought about trying to relight it sitting there, but glad they didn't because they found a protective dust cap inadvertently left in a place in the gas generator oxidizer injector inlet port, which would have created an anomaly in that in that launch a uh, little bit till it blew up, till. Uh, that, that plug melted. So anyway, and of course, they took this famous picture of their friends, Jim Lovell and uh, um, Jim Lovell, who's 90, what is he? Jim Lovell's 96 and we just lost Frank Borman. They're inside Gemini 7 there, launched 10 days earlier. The successful launch was December 15th, three days later, took this historic pictures on this mission. Happy birthday. We've got 72nd birthday to astronaut and astronomer Stephen Hawley. There's Stephen, obviously a Kansas fan. He was born in Ottawa, Kansas, but regards Salina, Kansas as his hometown. Born Stephen Allen Hawley, December 12th, 1951. We've got his story on our Facebook page there. 32 days in space on, on um, uh, five missions including the upgrade of the Hubble, two upgrades of the Hubble, 31 and, um, or deployment of the Hubble, he was on 31, and then the upgrade in 97, STS-82. A uh, very experienced uh, astronaut, uh, teaches astronomy or did as an emeritus professor at the University of Kansas. That's why he's a Jayhawk fan. And they're always a pretty good basketball team. Yeah. And then we've got the uh, happy 59th birthday to Ken Ham. Guess what his nickname is? <laughs> Hawk. Oh, okay. Ha Ken Ham Hawk. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, shuttle pilot and commander. Pilot of 124, commander of 132, laid in the program. <clears throat> 25 days in phase. He delivered the Kibo module to the space station. So he was born in Plainfield, New Jersey, in a Navy captain. And I know them Navy astronauts are really proud of the Navy, aren't they? Yes, they are. All right. Well, there we got Ken Han's birthday. And uh, we're going to turn it over to Terry White here. Terry, why don't you tell us your your Christmas story? Okay. I was senior manager, and it was over a, a, a period where we are working part of the Christmas holiday. And I get a call to report to the operations desk in orbiter processing facility number two. When I walk through the door, I look on top of the desk is one of those huge cookies. And we're not allowed any food, any drinks whatsoever in that, in the hangar at all. So the first thing out of my mouth is, what in the heck is this cookie doing in here? <laughs> and the guy at the operations desk pointed, and there's Mark Kelly standing there. Astronaut, Mark yes. Kelly. Yeah. And <clears throat> He was going to be the commander of the flight we were working on at the time. And he goes, he says, I just flew in from Texas. I wanted to tell the people that are working how much I appreciate them giving up their holiday to work on the vehicle for me. So I brought them something to eat. And I says, well, well, we'll get them as many as we can afford to out in the break room. You can take the cookie out there and they'll come out there <laughs> and, and, and eat the cookie with you and, and get to talk to you. So, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Estia, that would have been uh, was was that a launch in January or something? Yeah, January or a little bit later, because uh, yeah, it wouldn't have been January because we're working Christmas still in the OPF. We had a couple of months away from the launch. Yeah, it's looking, so yeah, and I don't remember which one it was. So, uh, at a glance, I would guess it it was. Um, 
doesn't matter. It was but, in the early days. But uh, what was the attitude about the workers working the Christmas holiday and New Year's and stuff like that? Well, there was a lot of them that liked the overtime and that, but there were others that we had to because of their skills would, would, to come in and check the systems like the ohm system, the orbital maneuvering system and that, check out the hypergalls and that. And so uh, they got paid good for doing that, but to give up even, they even have to come in on like Christmas Day and New Year's Day and that. But we told them you come in, get the work done, and you get paid for the whole day. So once you, you know, go home as soon as you have the tasks done that you need to hmm. do, so. I'm going to ask Marty to comment there because uh, 51 years ago, Apollo 17 is walking on the moon. Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt are walking on the moon at this very moment, 51 years ago, on their second day on the moon. And uh, Marty, you Apollo workers, Jim, or, or whatever contractor you work for, there were certainly some holidays that you had to work, right, sir? Oh, definitely, yeah. And uh, we've, we've got, got a picture of your Grumman crew in our workers' gallery, uh, and they got a big old turkey spread out around there in the break room. And uh, so uh, uh, that was, uh, you know, the attitude always was do what it takes to get the job done, right? Yeah. Don't but as long at... as we have, like, the space station up there, there's people working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 mm -hmm. days a year supporting that that's up there. That's right. Well, just like there will be people at your convenience stores Christmas Day to, <laughs> to uh, take your money for gas and, and snacks and uh, maybe an adult beverage or two. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so, uh, but yes, we, uh, we hope everybody does enjoy the holidays. We'll be talking about that a lot next week, of course. And uh, then we'll just announce we're going to take a break the last week of December. Marty and I will take the week off. We will reprise some various uh, programs uh, uh, probably pick one of yours out to reprise stuff like that so people don't miss get their fix and stay curious okay. between uh, Christmas and New Year's and then we'll be back January 3rd so uh, uh, from the 23rd to January 3rd the museum will be officially closed so well let's talk about this important mission of the return to flight of the first reusables uh, wing spacecraft there is Columbia landing after its first flight uh, <clears throat> in the uh, desert out there at Edwards Air Force Base where they had uh, no constraints of where they could put her down everything was flat and hundreds visible. of miles of flat desert the only thing is you can see in that picture it's kicking up a lot of sand yeah and that sand is like gravel so it was beating up the tiles aft of the main landing gear all that sand was going up there and peppering the tiles so we had a lot of tile work to do just because of where they landed it and you had to immediately create a system to discern what was damaged from the landing yes. what was damaged from the liftoff and what could possibly be micrometeorite or debris yeah, damage yeah. In, in orbit in space yeah uh, did you already as uh, figure that out no, as we were doing our detailed inspections and that, and and we were even picking foam from the external tank out after the first flight. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is why I love emphasizing is Terry and all the people working on the, in 1981 on the shuttle, everything was a new database and looking at it for the first time and trying to figure it out. Yeah, and it was the first time you ever got a spacecraft back to the launch site to go over it, and in this case, we were going to launch that same spacecraft again. Yeah, and, and I think you can underestimate the, I'm not gonna say uncertainty, but the, uh, uh, it had to be proven that, that you could do it. Yes, you know? yeah, so we, uh -huh. we had to analyze all the different systems and see what worked 100% and what had issues in that. We had that, and I was a supervisor on the thermal protection system, what people commonly refer to as the tiles. There's a lot more to it than just tiles. But yeah, we had to inspect everything and look at all the things that didn't match the criteria. And then the design center wanted us to take off tiles that were perfectly good, but they wanted to analyze them. They wanted to analyze the structure underneath them. And then we had the issue where we had hundreds of tiles that had never been hardened. 
So when we're getting ready for STS-1, we found out that the tiles were not going to stay glued on the ship because the bottom of the tile was not hard enough. So we had to take, and Columbia had over 32,000 tiles on it, so we had to take the tiles back off, harden them, and reinstall them on the ship. Well, we didn't get all of them done before they opted to go fly STS-1. But we got all the critical ones on the upper surface and all of the tiles on the lower surface hardened and reinstalled. But then when we came back, we had to take the rest of them off because we lost tiles on STS-1. and what The ones we lost were the ones that were not hardened. Hmm. And we didn't lo always lose the entire tile. Some of the tile, <clears throat> because of the flexing of the payload bay doors and that, the tiles were cut into 16 pieces, almost like tile on your floor are, mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, so uh, we would lose three or four pieces out of the 16, but uh, all the tiles we lost were in the low temperature areas, so we did no damage to the structure of the vehicle. But I had 200 tiles on the forward that had to be removed and new tiles put on that were hardened. And then we had all the ones that sustained flight damage and uh, the ones that were being analyzed and the forward contained all the antennas for the vehicle. So they wanted to pull some antennas, which meant we had to take off all the tiles that covered the antenna. So Yeah, that's what we've learned from Terry is underneath those tiles are a lot of antennas and electronics and yes. and yeah. uh, things and, in there. And that, Columbia had all kinds of sensors on it that the other vehicles had very little instrumentation, but we had tiles with heat sensors in them, thermal couples in them. We had acoustical sensors. We had all kinds of instrumentation on Columbia. And uh, once again, uh, learning how to fly reusable spacecraft. So once we get it back, Columbia, the official uh, emblem here, uh, the spacecraft, uh, which this is OV-102 is the tail number. All right, not OV-100 or 101, it's 102. Uh, it's uh, depicted with the crew members' uh, surnames there. Uh, Joe Engel was the commander. Uh, Richard Truly was the pilot. Uh, Engel was an X-15 uh, fighter pilot. Okay, uh, both of them uh, rookies. Okay, had never flown had in never space flown before. in space before. Uh, Joe but Engel still alive. He's age ninety and truly just celebrated a birthday in November. Uh, eventually, they credited the X-15 pilots as attaining yeah. enough altitude, so you know the break in the Carmen line. Yeah, as a Carmenot, we call them. November twelfth, eighty one, at ten uh, ten ten in the morning. Uh, is when it took off, and it was up there for just a little over two days. Okay, I think it was supposed to be a longer mission. Uh, basically tested the um, uh, robotic arm, or was that on three? was the first robotic arm, I think. But that's what the insignia means there. Let's look at, uh, there's the astronauts. Uh, Joe Engel on the left, uh, Dick Truly on the right. Truly was a... Uh, uh, Former NASA administrator, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah, in there. Uh, we're not familiar with those suits they have on there. That's the old style suits. Okay. You're used to the ones from later on in the program, so. Well, they were like uh, SR-71 Blackbird type mm -hmm. of suits, and uh, they were test pilots. This was the second flight. Yes. And uh, they had ejection seats in there, like the Gemini, didn't they? Yes, Columbia was the only one built with ejection seats. It had two, but then after the first five flights and we started flying more than two astronauts, we disabled the uh, ejection seats because they said it wasn't fair to only have two with more than two crew members. Mm -hmm. And then when we did the first major modification of Columbia back in California, they actually removed all the ejection seat mechanisms. And that was uh, not necessarily controversial, but not many people thought that would work. Correct. Either. John Young, who flew STS once, thought that he'd be barbecued uh, by the uh, SRBs as they roared by him. Yeah. <laughs> was yeah I, I, if, I, if the hatch opened up and they didn't crash their brains on the yeah, roof. Yeah. I'd, I never envisioned them getting out while the boosters are still burning. So, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, there's our two great guys still around. Think about that. There's a Tom Usiak photograph. Looks like that'd make a good puzzle, except all the black there. Night shot of the uh, service structure. 
remote service structure around the, the bird there for the second time. What was it like to bring it out there for the second time? I mean, uh, it, it, it wasn't near the press. Oh, the press. Okay. For, that, for, the, the, for the first time, there was press people everywhere. I remember the night we rolled uh, Columbia over into the VAB to get Maida to go out and half the VAB transfer aisle and you know how big that is, having been in there, was full of mm -hmm. press. Yeah, I mean, they were just, wow. they had chain link fence across to keep them from getting hmm. too close to the operation, but they were just everywhere inside there and then finally cleared them out and could go back to work getting ready to hmm. lift it and stack it. Uh, was there like a a sense of like, you know, doing something no one ever done before or was it just you guys were just... You've been working on this bird for so long anyway. Yes. But uh, and it was just it was just the next step of the of the process of getting it ready to launch. You know, we got it complete in the OPF and oddly on STS two, in the OPF they had a platform that wasn't properly stowed and they moved to Elevon and slammed it into the platform. And they damaged a bunch of the tiles and the structure on the Elevon. So when we're still in the OPF, managed to get the structure work done but did not get all the tiles replaced. But that was not my area of responsibility. Mm -hmm. I was up on the forward and we'd been working 12 hours a day, seven days a week to get all the work done on the forward <clears throat> and still had more work to do over in the VAB when we got it over there. Well, it turns out <clears throat> they couldn't get the work done on the Elevon. So they told me, well, you're gonna go down there and supervise the people on the Elevon and finish it out there. And I said, as a matter of fact, if I go down there, I'm taking my text. I said, no, you're using the text down there. I said, nope, I know my text capabilities. We'll go down there. So went down there and worked on the Elevon. And <clears throat> we didn't finish the tile work on the Elevon while we're still in the VAB. So they set up seven tiers of scaffolding at the pad. And we climbed up all of that scaffolding to go continue bonding the tiles on the Elevon out at the launch pad. Yeah, in, in the weather and everything. We got all sand the sand and the wind yeah, and got, the air. Got all that done. So the entire STS2 flow, I'd basically been working 12 hours a day and finally got to an eight hour day. And then, then we had an oxidizer spill on the forward reactionary control system. The oxidizer did not harm the tiles or the glue, but it turned the paint underneath them back to a liquid. So I had to stand out there the very first night because only three people that were qualified for the thermal protection system had the full respirator certification. So myself and two technicians stood up there at, at the 207 foot level on wooden pick boards Ooh. with no fall protection because we didn't wear fall protection then at the pad, holding the tiles on the ship because they were starting to slide because the paint had turned. The oh liquid, so we're holding them on, taking them off one at a time and handing them to someone who put them in a special bag to go get them decontaminated. Because like I said, it didn't hurt the tile, but you had to get all that oxidizer and everything cooked out of them. So basically they had to barbecue them. But 386 tile we had to remove out at the launch pad. And you're 200 feet up in the yes. air on, yes. a, on a plank. Yes. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah. And... Third shift came to work because I was second shift at the time. Third shift came to work. They didn't have anybody qualified. So they were bringing in trainers and people to train the first shift in the morning. But so we had to stand up there the rest of the night. First shift came in in the morning, went to training classes to get their certification to use the, the hardline breathing apparatus. And then they came up to relieve us. So I finally got to go home about 11 o'clock that day. So. But Terry, you know, I probably would have loved to work for you, but I'm going to be honest with you. I am afraid of heights. <laughs> All right. So would I be able to say to you and without any repercussions? No, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I had some people that did not like working at heights, so they would not go out to the launch pad. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them were skeptical about in the vehicle assembly building because you're working at heights in yeah. there as well. But yeah, yeah, so yeah, so they continue to do work in the orbiter process. You would find business. a place for somebody. It yeah. wasn't like you have to do this or yeah. or go grab your yeah. uh, locker and get mm -hmm. out of here. Uh, uh, but that's good because that's one thing that strikes me is, boy, uh, Marty has worked on the slaw of the Saturn V where the LEM was when it was up there. And 
and he's told stories about it feeling the Saturn V move around. And well, I could sit right, watch, Marty. Watch the orbiter move back and forth. You could watch it move. I understand you could push it, couldn't you? You, you, could, you? you couldn't push it much, but you could watch it move, especially out of the pad and the wind, it would move. And that's what made it very difficult bonding tile because you have to apply the right pressure to the glue cures. And that's eight, 10, 12 hours on that, but you can't have that moving. So you would constantly be adjusting things while it's moving. So. One day we'll have to do a program about how that thing is latched in those three places because when you're out there at the pad with a hundred ton spacecraft, yes. okay, and and gravity doesn't move it, break those attach points. That's just wow. That's a lot of stress and gravity on it that is. stuff. So, yes. uh, do you know much about that? That we can uh, do a program uh, next time? Not a lot, but oh. I mean, you're right. There's only three places. Yeah. Yeah. And one one bolt up front and two nuts in the back. Whew, that's amazing. How big are them bolts? The, no, the big... bolt is this big around. Uh-huh. Yeah. We've got one of the fir the bolts from the uh, hold down bolts. For, for the, the boosters. SRBs. Yeah, yeah, yeah the I'm boosters. talking about Those the, are about the, the forward... uh, eight inches in diameter. Yeah, no, the forward bolt for the uh, orbiter itself. Yeah. Well, here we see beautiful STS-2 on the pad. Now, STS-1 and STS-2 both had white uh, external tanks. Correct. And uh, there is the blast off, okay? And uh, I'm going to tell you how you can tell the difference between the two. But why were the tanks white and why didn't they continue that? Well, why didn't they continue it? Because uh, I get different stories about how much it was, but it's hundreds of pounds of paint. Marty, you say about 600, don't you? Yeah. Pounds. Yeah. So everything we did was to make the vehicle as light as possible. So putting an extra 600 pounds of paint on it really didn't prove anything. I mean, cosmetically, it looked nice, but functions, you didn't need the white. So, you know, it wasn't for reflectivity or anything else. So quit painting it. You know, and we can save 600 pounds. And in those days, they used to say it cost $10,000 a pound yeah. to take something to orbit. Yeah. So, you know, that's... Well, we'll buy that. But then through the, the shuttle era, the 30-year era of it, uh, the the uh, ET tank was uh, made lighter, more efficient, I guess. Uh, was there any talk, because you've got the foam coming off the tank, that the paint or a latex type of paint would have kept stuff on there. No, there was there was talk about putting something to, to make it, but then they were afraid that if they did, and the foam was failing at the bond line on the external tank, to my mm -hmm. knowledge. I'm not a tank guy in that. But, at the you know, bonding line against the tank. Yeah. Because you got 250 below zero on the other side of that Co skin factor. Correct. There. And, and so they said it just may wind up you getting larger pieces coming off instead of a smaller piece. In other words, the, the, yeah, the paint or whatever you use together. holds it together. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, you know, talking to the tank guys after uh, the Columbia incident is that, <clears throat> that they should have been using a heater there to heat that area instead of trying to come up with foam because they were having a, a hard time getting the foam to adhere you know, and so, you know, on ground conditions, let alone flight conditions and that, but they had been changing and that, and the EPA had them change chemicals that they were using to clean with and they weren't as satisfied with them. But uh, yeah, it was- uh, Again, a launch in January, which Columbia was, and of course, yeah, Challenger. Yeah, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, huh. I don't think Columbia had anything to do with the cold. That was just an area that they should have gone to putting heaters on to stop that issue of the of the icing up and that instead of just the relying on the foam so mm -hmm. uh so uh which one is this the white tank there uh there's just a several distinguishing marks there is a distinguishing mark about the orbiter correct uh and terry you taught me that marty i think you'd be happy to point out how you know this is columbia right off the bat it's the only vehicle with black on the upper wing Yep, see that right up there, Marty, in the upper wing? The black uh, right uh, beside... Uh, it's called the wing yep, glove, there but you that go. area right there, yep. yes. 
Yeah. Now, Why was that black for? Well, right before we're getting ready to roll out of the orbiter processing facility, they came down with a requirement to paint the upper wing with high temperature black paint. But they were concerned that that area of the wing wasn't as thick as the rest of the wing. And when it came time to re-enter, they were concerned about that area being significantly cooler and the heat coming across the lower surface and that big temperature differential, they thought it could be a structure problem. So they said, go paint it. So before they re-enter, they'll turn that side to the sun and heat it up uh, to 250 degrees. And that way it will help against the heat at the bottom. And uh, they realized after the fact they didn't need it, but it had, once it had the black wings, it kept the black wings. So you modelers out there, if you're gonna make Columbia, you gotta put that black uh, the, the portion there on, on the, the wing on glove the, on the yeah. wing glove there yeah. and, and uh, I'll, I'll see photos and they'll say oh this is columbia i said not no no it isn't because it, it doesn't have the oh, black I'm, wing i'm trying to make that big just like you might see this photo and say that that's sts2 or is it sts1 it's, we got the we got the that's that's one of them that's two that's it, one which one's which that one is this one is two and this one is one i thought two had the ring no one one, had, one has the ring on okay. the top one has the ring at the top marty's going to show you that thank you tommy usiak for pointing that out there is a black ring around the top of the et and there is not one on sts2 there so that that's how you tell the difference apart uh can't find out any documentation of why that rings there i've actually seen it it misused all right with the with a real close-up of it yeah. laying horizontal in the the hanger there and there's but, no uh, no stripe on the left hand booster either yeah there you go they mm -hmm. weren't doing that later so they could tell left from right in the photos gotcha okay uh and then there's another beautiful shot uh by uh, the ucx there love pictures like this uh How'd they make that picture? From an aircraft. Of what kind of aircraft? The different I say kinds of aircraft. I've seen photographs from commercial airliners oh, okay. taking photos of, from a ways away. But well, that's probably yeah. a T thirty eight. One of probably. the I, I believe that was yeah. John Young took that picture, who was the commander of the first one. He says, I'm gonna fly a T thirty eight around the second one. Watch yeah. watch it go off there. And uh cool picture there. Look at the, the ocean there and the, the, the shoreline and uh Love those pictures there. And uh, then they got up in orbit, and we're assuming this is STS-1 with some of the tiles on the OM part, orbital maneuvering pod there. Um, yeah, because those are the ones that weren't hardened. That's okay. a lower temperature area in that, so, yeah. And now, there's no tile there right now, is there? They replaced them with? Mostly with blankets. Blankets, but the leading edge still has tile. But later on, we did a thing that we called the eyeball mod. But the area right there was getting hotter than the white tile could withstand. The white tile maxed out at 1,200 degrees. Uh -huh. The black tile at 2,300 degrees. So an engineer analyzing data from flight realized that that area was getting hot. And you have a fuel tank right inside there that you can't get hot. So, uh, oh, yeah, right, a tank, yeah, sure, yeah, for the pod, yeah. So, the, uh, the orbital so maneuvering. We, we took off a bunch of tile right there, replaced the white ones with the black ones that solved that problem. And that, but you know, how there's certain moths that have what look like fake eyeballs on a moth, yes. yeah, yeah, okay, so, yeah. So, we did those areas in black, so when the payload bay doors are closed, you look back there, it looks like two eyes. So we call that one the eyeball mod. So oh, okay. Interesting. Of course, this is all for re-entry. The the uh the ten minutes uh, when they're in the plasma of the Earth's atmosphere coming in at uh, ten thousand miles an hour. Actually they come in at seventeen thousand miles an hour. Seventeen thousand three hundred is three, what they start. You back only in. have to go two hundred miles an hour slower to lose and your And then Mrs. Gravity grabs you and brings you home. Wow. And uh, uh, and there's uh, inside the orbital processing and, facility. And that's Columbia when it first came here from Palmdale on Easter weekend. They hadn't finished it. You can see all the green areas right there. That you know, and that was you're looking right at my area of responsibility. So I worked the thermal protection system mm -hmm. on the crew module. So all I had to was responsible for getting all the tile that you see that are missing there 
on and some of them had never been installed in california mm. so yeah that was a mess that's 1979 correct in there okay and the uh aft engine the rear engine there um What's that device do we're looking at? Okay, that, that is a big heister, and it has an attachment on the front that goes right in and fastens into the engine. And then they remove the bolts from the engine, and the heister backs out with the engine right off of the front of it. The heister. Yeah, now, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, specially modified forklift. Awesome. Uh, that, that tip of it's designed just to hit the inside and, of the yeah, injector and they'll, area. And of the, there'll be a guy riding right up on the top of it. Now, you see those red uh, engine cones up there at the top of the picture. So, that's the other side. Of, those are the orbiter uh, maneuvering. Uh, it. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's back the end of, of the orbiter orbit. maneuvering. <clears throat> yeah, that's the back the of other. that. Yes. That's the business end of that. There. Yeah, there's 16 so. thrusters plus the two Ohm's engines. You look two little circles right to the side of that red engine cover. Yes, there's a cut. Right. You can see the cut thrusters there. And then down the yeah. side, you can see three along the side. So. Right. Uh, Marty's going to show you that important part there. Now, uh, a little further right, too, you got two. Those two, two there. right there, and then you have three more right there. Now, those so. would be more for orbiting, for maneuvering around close, getting close to the Hubble telescope, and, that kind of stuff. Yes, and for maneuvering when you're re-entering because you do, you have to slow down. You have to get that 17,003 okay. and slow all the way down to 200 miles an hour. The red engines, are they? That's that's what you burn to go to, like, to Hubble, to do a higher orbit. Right. Okay, but <clears> that's what you burn to slow you down to come home. So they're turning around backwards, they fire the uh, Ohm's <laughs> engines to slow them down to 17.3, and then that's what starts bringing them back in. Every engine was taken out and inspected, correct? Yes, the main engines, yes. And, Sometimes uh, more than once. Um, and what's unique about these engines today? They're still using them. Yeah? Yeah. Where? I, I don't know which vehicle's using them now. The Artemis is. Artemis, yeah. The yeah. FTLS yeah. has four of them. Right? Four of them, yeah. And then... It broke Marty's heart to watch it dump in the ocean there. He was oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. They're not reusing any of it. You know, they're not reusing the boosters. They're dumping them in the ocean. So Well, you know, uh the, it's got the bragging rights for the best engine ever, rocket engine ever, mm -hmm. reusable, uh out of the I, I did the math three times hundred and thirty five, uh five hundred and something uh engine uh, ignitions and so forth, and I think there's only one anomaly uh, out of all that yeah. that, that uh, one actually shut 50, down. Fifty-one thousand parts in an engine, and not after every flight, but still over a, a, a short period of time, we replaced seventeen thousand of those parts. Called the SMS RS twenty fives now, aren't they, Marty? Yeah. It was the S Space Shuttle main engine SSME when Marty was a launch. Uh, process uh, services manager for this so well we're enjoying talking to terry white here always let terry just kind of freewheel it here about what we want to talk about love this kind of interesting picture a place i've never been in my life and never will be but you just scooted across there hundreds of times i'm sure uh looks pretty clean under this one. Oh, we well, what, what does a trained eye see there marty we, or just, <laughs> terry well, that's the main landing gear right there. You can see the door uh -huh. off to the side, but the main landing gear sitting there. And that looks like it's not all the way in because it doesn't set. It's crossing a trench. There's a trench around in the floor that if we had a spill, it goes right into that. Oh, and, that gray yeah, area yeah, there. Yeah. So you, you bring it on in. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's on its landing gear now. Then once we get it into the, to the hangar, then... Uh, we lift it up to what's called maintenance height, that we have jacks that we put underneath it and raise it up. Then later on in the program, because we had to jack it up in the early days by hand, sit there and pump these jacks to lift that 200,000 pound orbiter. So later on in the program, when we had time, then they came in and put hydraulic lifts in the floor so we could raise it hydraulically. Hmm. Very cool. And this is the landing of STS-2 out at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, uh, you did not go out there for landings, not for, did you? I did, but not early oh. in the early days. So uh, Again, you've got all this dust, sand being kicked up. and Yeah, they weren't landing on the concrete <clears> runways <throat> <and>, yet. Uh, <clears throat> doing some damage to the orbiter. And the, the first picture on the left 
Boy, that had to have been a beautiful sight to see with your own eyes. I've never saw that either, but the the the, the, the trails there through the atmosphere and um, and the successful landing there, and then they put it back on a space uh, uh, shuttle aircraft, uh, the seven forty seven, and brought it back to you again. And um, you know what was the what was the feeling the second time around? That looking at it and seeing all the damage on it and seeing the you could you could tell the heat marks and that you could see the scorch marks of that and so you could tell exactly how the the heat flowed across it which really helped us that had to be important yeah it, did, it, did it you really did because they had come out there to document this stuff right away or well in those days in, in, in those days yeah but we had crazy. a bunch of engineering teams from the design center in down in california come out and look at it because you know they they thought the heat went one way and it turns out by looking at the streak marks it went a little bit different from what uh -huh. they had envisioned so uh yep and we talked about that last month with terry white as we looked underneath the belly of this orbiter here, there's Atlantis with the projection of the moon landing, Apollo 11 moon landing on it during a Yuri's night a few years ago. Um, uh, yeah, we did a uh, look at last month. We kind of took the top and the bottom of the wings, and Terry just sort of gave us what, what he was seeing there. A lot more than meets the eye. You better believe it on these complicated machines here. Marty, do you have something you want to say? No. Yeah. Okay, yeah, there's the, the belly of Atlantis uh, angled at an attack angle coming into Kennedy Space Center there. Looks beautiful. Terry, you've been following the, uh, the uh, uh, installation of uh, Endeavor out there at uh, the oh, California. California. Yeah, yeah. When, uh, one of my techs, who's now a manager, uh, goes out there. He's the move director of when they're moving that vehicle. So they always bring him out there to do it. And so, uh, yeah, he sends me photos of the latest things they're doing with it. So. Yeah, they've got both uh, SRBs now yeah. up and erected. Uh, uh, to Tell everybody what they're doing with Endeavor. Well, right they're going to set it in the vertical position, you know, where... Uh, Launch position. Yes, yeah. where uh, Atlantis is like it was in space with the payload bay doors open, you know, like it's flying in space. Discovery's just setting like the shot in the hangar sitting on this landing gear on the ground, payload bay doors closed and that. But uh, Endeavor's going to go be set up in the in the launch configuration and that. And, so, and they put a payload in their payload bay. So, And uh, you'll be able to look at different levels uh, in the museum and get up and look in and yeah. so, stuff like that. I believe they're going to have – well, I was talking to astronaut Kay Heyer about it. Okay. She's got some friends out there. And they're going to open up one of the payload bay doors so you can look inside of it. And the other one will be closed. Yeah. So from one profile, it'll look like it is it's on the just, pad yeah. ready to launch. Well, we open the payload bay doors at the pad as well because yeah. we installed payloads at the pad. But yeah. Uh, but you had to have the service structure around it to do that, of yep. course, right? Yeah. Uh, Kay was pointing out that, uh, wow, this is a earthquake situation out there all the time. And that she was saying that they had to bury beneath the SRBs all kinds of structural support things, springs mm -hmm. and things like yeah. that. Yeah, just uh, like they do in a lot of their buildings out yeah. there. They're on, they're on a spring system. And I hadn't thought about that. but mm -hmm. uh, uh, So that'll look beautiful. Of course, if you go out to the visitor's complex and there at the Atlantis building, you see the uh, SRBs and ET outside there without the tank on there. And I always look up at it and go, man, it's pretty freaking big for sure up there. So... Uh, Terry, we've enjoyed having you on today. Why don't you read off some of our friends watching today? Okay. Doug Forrest. Yep. Dave Stangy. Stangy. Dave Stangy. Yeah. Uh, Bill Whiting. It's not the Bill Whiting I used to work with on the shuttle, I don't believe. but No. <laughs> and no. Then, he's, uh, he's, the, he's the Michigander up there. He's okay. A, oh, that's right. Tom Usenak. Usiak. Tom Usiak, our yeah. photography friend there. Oh, that's right. Mark, Aaron yeah. Harvey. Uh, Carlton Bailey, Cliff Watson, and Ophelia. Ophelia Sotterall. Sotterall. Okay. She's in France. Okay. Cliff's in uh, Hello in Pomona, Australia. And uh, he's probably getting his ticket ready. He'll be in the States for the eclipse April 8th. Okay. And uh, Aaron Harvey, that's a new name. Glad, glad that you've joined our Stay Curious Watchers here, Aaron. Thank you very much. Marty, what else you got going on over there? You got a. Also, we have uh, Peggy 
Pearl Bert, Bert, if I pronounced that correctly. Yep, Pearl Bert. Bert she's, she's my sister. sister. All right. And his brother. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're glad that, that your brother was on here today. We always enjoy it. Terry, was there anything you wanted to comment about Apollo 17 on the moon 51 years ago and nobody's been back since? I know. Why is that? Uh, it's, it's a little thing called the country has to have the desire. The country does not understand all the benefits they have from space. If so, they would really want to fund more travel into space because we benefit so much from the things we've done. You know, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle, and that. So uh, everything in your day-to-day -day life now is a spinoff from space. People just don't really understand it. So it's, it was never published, so... Well, uh, they do have a spinoff magazine now that tells you some. Yeah, but that's that's pretty interesting. But you know, it's 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 limited audience with that. But well, Mr. Harrison Schmidt, Jack Schmidt, who says who was on the moon walking fifty one years ago, he's eighty eight years old. He's a great guy to talk with. I've talked with him a couple have of you? times. Yes. Yeah. I, I, what would uh, what you talk about? What uh, you... Just talked about what it was like to go to the moon and that, and you know. And he would just, he'd come in when we'd be doing inductions into the next Hall of Fame for astronauts and that, that all the astronauts showing up for the event would come to the OPF and we'd walk around and, and answer questions for them and, and talk to them and that. And uh, it wasn't an autograph session or anything like that because they'd have their spouse with them and that and get, mm -hmm. to, get to take them inside the vehicle. And, you know, m most of the astronauts wanted to see other parts of the shuttle you know the spouses wanted to go inside the crew module the rest of them said that nah, we've been in there <laughs> yeah right we, can we look in the wings go ahead so yeah. you can crawl in the wings you just have to, have to listen to a briefing first but yeah so. everybody wants to crawl in those wings that was that been an interesting thing well uh jack schmidt says uh, and i've heard him lecture several times uh he says that we really blew it uh, after the apollo landings we had the whole world looking at us uh, and, and being, respecting, uh, and, and us, respecting yes. us, yeah. and being our scientific prowess, uh, we had been to the moon. Russia failed uh, doing it, and and uh, he he said from a PR standpoint, that was the moment in history that we should have propelled our country to. Yeah. What, what we we did, but not in space anymore. We should have. I mean, there's so many people that that went to college because they wanted to be part of the space thing and that, but there was a limited number of jobs. So they went into other industries, automotive industries, all kind of, and it really enhanced our economy. Yes. And the world really respected us. Uh huh. And it just kind of went away. We, we gave up interplanetary or, or uh, voyages for the low earth orbit, uh, which wasn't a bad thing. This, you know, 23 years, human beings have continuously been in space, thanks. To the space shuttle, uh, right. no doubt about it, creating that that uh, oasis. Yeah, nothing Earth. could have done that construction project right. without in the there. shuttle. In there, so, well, Terry, great to see you again. You got any other comments about what's going on in the space world today? Nope. So the government accounting office says uh, NASA doesn't have the money till twenty twenty seven to land on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> There's still now, a lot of a nobody's lot of really talking about that a whole yeah. lot. That, well, at least they're talking about landing on the moon again for a long time it was oh no we're not going to go back to the yeah. moon we're going to go straight to mars but we have to learn to live on the moon before we can go to mars so well i hope it happens and i hope people like yourself are inspired to to lead that as uh we explore and like terry says every time we explore it benefits everybody on earth not one dollar has been exchanged for anything in outer space it's all spent here correct yeah people talk about well look at the money they said and i remind them is there is no money in space all the money spent on on the space program is for salaries and materials here on earth but when they go up there the only money that goes up is if an astronaut carries some dollar bills <laughs> as souvenirs yeah. that's the only money in space and they're good jobs they're good jobs tell your babies to grow up to be engineers not Liberal arts majors like I did, okay? Uh, but uh, anyway, great having you here, my friend. We yes, hope sir. that you and your family have a wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas to them and Happy New Year to you. They've become friends of the American Space Museum, and we appreciate uh, the White family uh, supporting us uh, in, in the ways you do. Uh, you're going to 
I see your kin folk there in the mm -hmm. Louisiana area. Yep. Yeah, and Rebecca and Travis still talk about being on the show. Good, good, good. Well, I was talking about you, Rebecca, to Navy Captain uh, Kay Hire there about your submarine uh, chasing exploits there. And when I had Jay Honeycutt on here the other day, I asked him, Jay, where can you get some good gumbo? Because he's a Louisiana boy. Where can you get some good gumbo around here? You know what he said? You can't. Yep, you got to go to Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, bring me some, please, mm -hmm. next time. You ever had boudin? <laughs> I have. Okay, that's the only place you can get good boudin is out there. Yes. I, there was one place here, but it went out of business. But, yeah. So so you want me to bring Tell you back? Tell them what boudin is. So it's, it's a special sausage made. Uh, they make a lot of different ones now. But it, it's basically made with, with meat and rice and that stuffed into a sausage and it, it used to be a bar food out there all oh, the time yeah, and that, but it's, yeah but yeah. it's really good and for a long time the only place you ever heard of it was in louisiana but you never heard of it in new orleans i mean it was an out in the country oh really because i used to have truck drivers that come through there i said pick me up some boudin they said no one's ever heard of it i said you got to go out of town and so <laughs> <laughs> take the back roads and, and they'll have it and that but yeah well, now that you got us all hungry, we'll be ready to go eat some boudin somewhere there. Now, do you, do you just eat it or do you put it in a, a bun? Uh, no, I, I just cut it on a plate and eat it. So, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. And you have brought me back some delicious gumbo, and I appreciated that. Well, Marty, thank you for a great Streamlabs job. We always enjoy having Terry on here. Uh, the rest of the week, we're going to fill in as we please. We're going to talk about Apollo 17, of course, being on the moon. Only six times a year you can talk about being on the moon. Yes. And since we didn't do it, haven't done it in 51 years, I think it's a little bit worthy. Uh, so, uh, And some of the shuttles of the month of December. So we appreciate everybody watching today. If you uh, want to give to our museum, go up to our Facebook page. This is a time for giving and uh, get those tax breaks uh, that some of you need. So check that out. And uh, we've got some plans, big plans going on in 2024 and want you to be part of them as well as this guy, Terry White. So until next time, when we see you, I'm Mark Marquette saying, come visit our museum. Maybe Terry will be here and we'll bridge the space between us. Mm -hmm.